God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to the Word of God through Jesus Christ Street and Outreach Ministry. My name is Apostle Alan E. Coleman Jr. being used by God as the apostle, the teacher, and the prophet over this ministry, the Word of God through Jesus Christ. I'd like to ask you to join with us today for a very informative and powerful show. Please bring pens, uh, some paper to take notes, and your Bible so you can follow along with me in Scripture. And this might be one of the shows where I have one of my friends with me that are also in the Gospel. This ministry networks with a lot of ministers, and the Lord uses this ministry to even give ministers a chance that no one else would give a chance to. So today is going to be a very powerful show. I don't know what God is going to do today, but we are going to find out. The ministry's website is right here, so that way you can go on the website and you can check it out and you can feel yourself around and, and, and look, look on the different features of the ministry's website. Don't forget to sign the guest book and just enjoy yourself. We love you. This ministry loves you so much. And the ministry's phone number is 475 300 3850 24 hours you can call for prayer bible questions or whatever but in the meantime let's go back here and get into the word and see what the holy ghost would have us to study you see all these books behind me come on let's go let's go into the library And now, to the Word of God, through Jesus Christ, with Apostle Alan E. Coleman, Jr. God bless you, and enjoy the message.
wing shalt thou trust. Though we stand in the shadow of death, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Shield us through this night of terror, O King of the universe. Why is everyone afraid? Why is this night different from all others? Because this night the Lord our God will deliver us from the bondage of Egypt. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror of thy night. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to the Word of God through Jesus Christ, Street and Irish Telecast. My name is Apostle Alan E. Coleman, Jr. Tonight, late night, with all this stuff that's going on, the Lord is going to use us to come before him and get some answers. With all the stuff that's going on in this world. And a lot of people have no answers. Partly because they don't seek God for answers. The other part is because man is trying to follow their own inclination. But God wants to talk to us. There's something he wants to tell us. I'd like to ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus. We're going to read chapter 11, a couple of verses from there. So turn there, and before we touch anything, I'm going to open up with prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, forgive us for our sins and shortcomings. Forgive us for our faults and for our wrongs. Thank you for this time of fellowship and gathering. Thank you for blessing us to come before you, to be in your presence, oh God. Now we ask, Holy Father, that you minister to us, that you talk to us, that you answer some questions, that you confirm some things that you have already revealed unto your servants the prophets, and the prophetesses, and also to the evangelists, and to my brothers, the pastors, and my brothers, the apostles. Lord, we ask that you bless us to receive from you, to hear what thou hast said in Jesus' name. We thank you for hearing us and for answering us. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we pray. Amen. I ask, Father, that you make me usable and use me. I ask that you fill me with the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. I ask, Father, that you give me a spiritual understanding of your word. I ask, Father, that you surpass all of our understanding. We ask that you bring us on your level. I ask that you bless those that are watching by television, 
those that are watching by internet, those that are watching by YouTube or Facebook or wherever they're watching from. Again, I ask that you speak. Allow me to decrease that you may increase. Fill me with the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge from on high, and give me a divine understanding of your holy word. <laughs> You're giving me much information. Now let it pour out. In Jesus' name, let nothing come out of this mouth from me, but let it come from you, you Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and we pray. Amen. Look at this. Some of you might remember the Ten Commandment movie. When this scene right here was much longer due to editing. But this scene, when the death angel walked through the city, how Israel was not affected by Egypt was. Egypt is a symbol of the world. Those that are not saved or those that are carnal or those that won't listen to God have and are going through some things. But those of us that try to walk with God those of us that turn to him and trust in him. Oh, even right now during all of this, these political conundrums, there's some that are choosing to follow the red and some that are choosing to follow the blue. But there's some of us that are walking with God who are not having an opinion about either side, but rather have stepped back and stood next to God and allowed him to show us what's going on and then to use us as vessels to explain what's going on. To stick the devil out and to warn the people of God and say, trust God, not man. No man has power enough to go into hell or reach into hell and loose any demon. That spirit of coronavirus, if you want to blame somebody for sending that demon out, blame Satan. Because the death angel and spirits of sickness and addiction work for him. No man has authority over or in hell. But there's one demon, one hellish angel that has fallen. His name used to be Lucifer, now he is called Satan. His throne right now, his jurisdiction is hell, but he comes into the earth realm to steal and to kill and to destroy. But our God, those of us that are Christians, not Muslims, not Mormons, not Masons, not Eastern Stars, not Elk, not Catholics, yes I said it, not anyone who follows any other way except Scripture, no, we who follow the Word of God, only we have hope. 
We have no reason to be scared because our God doesn't give us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. So right now, it's time that we get right with God and we stand next to him because then and only then are we protected? Let's get into the word of God. While all this stuff is going on, all that you see going on in the earth realm, right now, we are in a precious place. And that place is with God. Exodus chapter 11. And, I, you know, I'm led to read this out of the Living Bible. I have a King James and several other Bibles with me, but I hear the Holy Ghost saying, read it out of the Living Bible because he wants it to be so plain and clear as he taught to some that might not be able to understand the King James or who thought they did and could. But could. Exodus chapter 11. And we're going to start at verse 1 and read up to verse 10. Stay with me. Verse 1 of Exodus chapter 11 out of the living Bible. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will send just one more disaster on Pharaoh and his land. And after that, he will let you go. In fact, he will be so anxious to let you go. Excuse me. He will be so anxious to get rid of you that he will practically throw you out of the country. Tell all the men and women of Israel to prepare to ask their Egyptian neighbors for costly gold and silver jewelry. For God caused the Egyptians to be very favorable to the people of Israel. And Moses was a very great man in the land of Egypt and was revered by Pharaoh's officials and the Egyptian people alike. Now, Moses announced to Pharaoh, Jehovah said, about midnight I will pass through Egypt, and all the oldest sons shall die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest child of Pharaoh, heir to his throne, to the oldest child of his lowest slave, and even the firstborn of the animals. The well of death will resound throughout the entire land of Egypt. Never before has there been such anguish and it will never be again. But not a dog shall move his tongue against any of the people of Israel, nor shall any of their animals die. <laughs> then you will know that Jehovah makes a distinction between Egyptians and Israelis. All these officials of yours will come running to me, bowing low and begging, please leave at once and take all your people with you. Only then will I go. Then, red-faced with anger, Moses stomped from the palace. The Lord had told Moses, Pharaoh won't listen. And this will give me the opportunity of doing mighty miracles to demonstrate my power. So although Moses and Aaron did these miracles right before Pharaoh's eyes, the Lord hardened his heart so that he wouldn't let the people leave the land. Now I'll turn to, well, let's continue on. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 36. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, From now on, this month will be the first and most important month of the Jewish calendar. Annually, on the tenth day of this month, 
announced this to all the people of Israel, each family shall get a lamb. For if a family is small, let it share the lamb with another small family in the neighborhood. Whether to share in this way depends on the size of the families. This animal shall be a year old male, either a sheep or a goat, without any defects. On the evening of the 14th day of this month, all these lambs shall be killed and their blood shall be placed on the two side frames of the door of every home and on the panel above the door. Use the blood of the lamb eaten in that home. Everyone shall eat roast lamb that night with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The meat must not be eaten raw or boiled but roasted, including the head, legs, heart, and liver. Don't eat any of it the next day. If all is not eaten that night, burn what is left. Eat it with your traveling clothes on, <laughs> prepared for a long journey, wearing your walking shoes and carrying your walking sticks in your hands. Eat it hurriedly. This observance shall be called the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt tonight and kill all the oldest sons and firstborn male animals in all the land of Egypt and execute judgment upon all the gods of Egypt. For I am Jehovah. The blood you have placed on the doorpost will be proof that you obey me. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And I will not destroy your firstborn children when I smite the land of Egypt. You shall celebrate this event each year. This is a permanent law to remind you of this fatal night. The celebration shall last seven days. For that entire period, you are to eat only bread made without yeast. Anyone who disobeys this rule at any time during the seven days of the celebration shall be excommunicated from Israel. On the first day of the celebration, and again on the seventh day, there will be special religious services for the entire congregation. And no work of any kind may be done on those days except the preparation of food. This annual celebration with unleavened bread will cause you always to remember today as the day when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. So it is a law that you must celebrate this day annually, generation after generation. Only bread without yeast may be eaten from the evening of the 14th day of the month until the evening of the 21st day of the month. For these seven days, there must be no trace of yeast in your homes. During that time, anyone who eats anything that has yeast in it shall be excommunicated from the congregation of Israel. These same rules apply to foreigners who are living among you just as much as to those born in the land. Again, I repeat, during those days, you must not eat anything made with yeast. Serve only yeastless bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and get lambs from your flocks. A lamb for one or more families, depending upon the number of persons in the families. And kill the lamb so that God will pass over you and not destroy you. Drain the lamb's blood into a basin and then take a cluster of hyssop branches and dip them into the lamb's blood and strike the hyssop against the lintel above the door and against the two side panels so that there will be blood upon them and none of you shall go outside all night. For Jehovah will pass through the land and kill the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood upon the panel at the top of the door and on the two side pieces he will pass over that home and not permit the destroyer to enter and kill your firstborn notice that it says God will pass through but it said 
he will pass over that home and not permit the destroyer. That's the angel of death, whose name is Samel. Those of you that study, you, you know that. Those that don't, well. Verse 24, and remember, this is a permanent law for you and your posterity. And when you come into the land that the Lord will give you, just as he promised, and when you are celebrating the Passover and your children ask, what does all this mean? What is this ceremony about? You will reply, it is the celebration of Jehovah's passing over us. For he passed over the homes of the people of Israel. Though he killed the Egyptians, he passed over our houses and did not come in to destroy us. And all the people bowed their heads and worshipped. So the people of Israel did as Moses and Aaron had commanded. And that night, at midnight, Jehovah killed all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt, from Pharaoh's oldest son to the oldest son of the captive in the dungeon, also all the firstborn of the cattle. Then Pharaoh and his officials and all the people of Egypt got up in the night, and there was bitter crying throughout the, all the land of Egypt. For there was not a house where there was not one dead. And Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron during the night and said, Leave us. Please go away, all of you. Go and serve Jehovah, as you said. Take your flocks and herds and be gone. And oh, give me a blessing as you go. <laughs> or actually, what it says is, Say farewell to me forever. <laughs> and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people of Israel to get them out of the land as quickly as possible, for they said, we are as good as dead. I'm going to read verse 33 again. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people of Israel to get them out of the land as quickly as possible, period. For they said, we are as good as dead. The Israelis took with them their bread dough without yeast and bound their kneading troughs into their spare clothes and carried them on their shoulders. And the people of Israel did as Moses said and asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord gave the Israelis favor with the Egyptians so that they gave them whatever they wanted. And the Egyptians were practically stripped of everything they owned. <sighs> the thought that God gave me for this little talk is called the depth of the biblical method of prayer. This is still that series, and this is volume two. The title is We Need Another Passover. We Need Another Passover. And this is part one. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, again, we ask you to forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings, because we sure have them. There's not one of us that can stand before you and say we are clean because we're not. We are guilty of one thing or another or of two things and maybe four. We ask that you purge us and wash us with that blood that was shed on Calvary. And even now, that you should speak to us and educate us. Because, Lord, your word is here, but we don't consult your word. We consult man. We consult woman. We consult ourselves. Some people who profess to be of the faith are consulting fraternities and secret societies. There's some people who say they follow you, but yet are into horoscopes 
and psychics and palm readers. Oh, glory to God. I thank you for being the God that you are. Wash us. Wash your people. Because we need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. You were already prepared a lamb for yourself. And you allowed him to be put on a cross with his arms stretched out wide. And then he said, it is finished. The plan of redemption was accomplished. The bridge between fallen man and an almighty God was restored. The curtain was torn in two. So that now we could just come before you. We don't need to go to a man to confess. We don't need to be validated by a woman. We don't need, oh God, to have membership in a building which now you have allowed to be closed because you wanted to be known that's not where you are that's not where you find God thank you thank you sir thank you now talk to us give us ears to hear and give us a receiving spirit in Jesus' name, we thank you and we pray. Amen. We need another Passover. Passover is a Jewish festival commemorative, meaning a memorial, of the exodus from Egypt. Uh, exodus means some synonyms are withdrawal, evacuation, exit, migration, the bottom line being leaving. The characteristics or the hallmark concerning the Passover are one, a commemorative or memorial or remembrance of the 10th play we just read about in Exodus 12. The other remembrance of the that the Jewish Passover is a memorial of is the necessity of blood applied. We read that in Exodus 12 verse 7. There's a lot of people who are not learned in the word, who say nowhere in the Bible does it say to plead the blood. You gotta let Joshua peek it around the corner there. But a lot of people who are not learned in the word, they don't understand the point of pleading the blood of Jesus. Whatever you plead the blood of Jesus on, the blood protects and cleanses. And whatever is covered in the blood, the enemy cannot touch. Because if he touch anything, that the blood is on. If he come in contact with that blood, he's going to be saved. And Satan, nor his children, nor any organization that he establishes, nor any uh, belief that he puts together, none of them want to be saved either. None of them. They'd rather find another way. 
But hold that thought. Because again, the characteristics of the hallmark concerning the Passover are the necessity of blood applied. The third remembrance of the Passover is that it is to be repeated annually. We read that in Exodus 12, verses 24 through 27. Now, the observances or the celebration of the Passover was done at Mount Sinai, Numbers 9, verses 1 through 14, and at the conquest, Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Now, conquest means conquering, crushing, subjugation, clobbering. <laughs> The three most important people in the conquest stage are Joshua, Caleb, and Rahab. Very important. Joshua being used by God to lead the people into the promised land. Caleb walking with him. And Rahab, the harlot, Christ came through her lineage. You didn't know that, did you? Some of you do. Also, the observances or celebration of the Passover was by Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 26, verses 18 and 19. Let's notice this. In Matthew 26, he replied, go into the city verse 18, and see Mr. So-and-so and tell him, this is the Living Bible, our master says, my time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as he told them and prepared the supper there. The conquest stage covers a period of closely 25 years. The book of Exodus and the book of Joshua, they go together. Exodus tells us how God led his people out of the land of bondage. And Joshua tells the reader how he led his people into the land of blessing. Moses summed up both books in Deuteronomy 6. Verse 23, I'm going to stay in the Living Bible, and here's what the scripture says. He brought us out of Egypt so that he could give us this land he had promised to our ancestors. God brought them out to bring them in to something different. A lot of people don't understand that when God is ready to move, he moves suddenly. There's a lot of people that have forfeited blessings because when God began to move, they didn't recognize that God was moving. I got to say this because God is telling me to. There are some people that God wants to bless with the covenant of marriage and he's put the person in your path, in your place, right in front of you, that he has decided way before the foundations of the earth were laid. He decided to join you with them because he knew that in them he put something that you'll need and in you he put something that they'll need but there's people that fight against god and they want to judge according to the flesh they want to judge according to what they want people are superficial some men say i want the twiggy some men say i love the full-figured woman some men say, I want the light skin. Some say, I want the dark skin. Some say, I want the long hair. Some say, I want the short hair. But what is God saying for you? What is God saying concerning your life? It's important to stay connected to him. 
in a position so that you can hear what he say because your life does not belong to you. And if it does, then you are not his. He's not going to share. He's a jealous God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When God gets ready to move, it's suddenly. He'll prepare you, though. But it's suddenly. In Exodus, we see how God parted the waters of the Red Sea to bring the people out of Egypt. Egypt is a kingdom in Northeast Africa and pronounced... Mitzrayim in Hebrew. This refers to upper and lower Egypt. In Joshua, the book of Joshua, God will part the waters of the Red Sea to bring his people into Canaan. Now, some specifications concerning Canaan is that Canaan, which was the promised land, consisted of seven nations. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. We can see that. The Living Bible says, When the Lord brings you into the promised land, as he soon will, he will destroy the following seven nations, all greater and mightier than you are. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. There are people of different beliefs, different nationalities, different faiths that are holding up your blessing. There's even some that are of the Christian faith. They may be babies. That also are holding up your blessing. The Lord lead me to minister to men concerning waiting for their wives. And the bad thing about some sisters, God said, is that when they meet a man of God, the Lord reveals to the man, this is your wife. When God says, pay attention to her, notice her, learn her, God is preparing that woman to be blessed in a way she has never been blessed before. If she has been through trials and tribulations in other relationships, if she's been abused and hurt and beat and lied to and cheated on, the man of God that God give you will not do that to you. Why? Because God has said concerning God's daughter, that is my daughter. He prepares the man. So he gives, he puts the man in the woman's path. He'll tell the man, tell her that I said for you to notice her. Tell her that I said that I've given you love for her. Now, you know, some sisters say, well, how can you love me so fast? How can you love? Well, listen to this. When a man is in Christ, and he sees as God blesses him to see. Huh. The love of God for what God gives him is in him. Because God is a God of preparation. But some sisters, they'd rather have the man with all the muscles. It don't matter whether he can pray or not. They'd rather have the man that's tall and with big feet. It don't matter. If that man loves the Lord or even knows the Lord or not. And then when they go through trial. Because of that man. Because of that relationship. Feet and all. Then they go before God. Crying. Sad. Same thing with men. I had to do ladies first. But the same thing with men. God will put a woman of God. In a man's path. 
Because God knows what this man needs. A woman that's a builder. A woman that's a help meet. She's a suitable helper. She is prudent, which means serious and grave. And the kind of woman that's not going to take a chance and, and forfeit what God bless her to have. But to that man, she might not look the part. We need to learn to stay close to God that we be able to see past the flesh, past the outside. Because there's a, <laughs> yes, Lord, God just told me to say this. There's a lot of people that have been single the last three to five years. And God said he tried to bless you more than one time. And each time he tried to bless you, you got in the way. Letting friends tell you how to conduct your relationships. Letting people tell you, well, God don't move that fast. Maybe he didn't move that fast for them because they might not be in position. But the moment we line up with God, then he blesses us. When we line up. <laughs> when we have us men stop chasing women. When we line up. Us men. When we don't desire to be with another woman. When we line up. The sisters, when they aren't looking at the man with the six pack or the eight pack. When they don't care what kind of car he drives. When you don't have the man calling you late night for a booty call. You know what that is. When you line up. When you don't have to be in the man's face all the time. When you know how to cover yourself up instead of going out putting everything on display. That, that's not, not attractive. Not to a man of substance. A man who walks with God does not, is not attracted to the type of woman that displays herself so that everyone and everything can see what she got. That's not attractive. Or the argumentative woman that want to argue, fuss, cuss, snap, flip. Don't nobody want that. Not a man of God. Why? Because the man of God is, is, is consecrated and he's walking with God, being used by God to work over a work for God. He has to be concerned about ministering to people. He has to be concerned about people's lives. See, I know that the world calls nurses and doctors and all them essential. They're really not essential. And I'm going to tell you why. Because they deal with the now. But the man of God, the man of God is not just dealing with the now, but the, oh, glory. Thank you, Lord. God said, but the man of God is also concerned about the after. In the book of Romans, chapter 10, very familiar scripture. A lot of people read verse 9 that says, for if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and believe in your own heart that God is raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And they say that's a sinner's prayer, which is not. But this is how they tell you to get saved, which is not. It's just telling you what happens when you believe and when you confess. Then in verse 10 it says, For it is by believing in his heart that a man becomes right with God, and with his mouth he tells others of his faith, confirming his salvation. Verse 11 says, For the scriptures tell us that no one who believes in Christ will ever be disappointed. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They all have the same Lord who generously gives his riches to all those who ask for them. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. True. Then it says in verse 14, but how shall they ask him to save them? Now, now let's stop there right for a minute. Because saved means to be rescued from the clutches of hell. Because if a person leaves this world not born again, they're going straight to hell. It don't matter what you say. It don't matter how you feel. It don't matter what your pastor say. It don't matter uh, what your organization says. If a person leaves this world unsaved, they're going straight to hell and going to be held there until the last day. What happens at the last day? The carrying out of the sentence to be cast, which means thrown into the lake of fire. But before that, every knee, 
even the knee that gets ready to get thrown, even the person that get ready to get thrown into the lake of fire, the soul get ready to get thrown in there, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Now you can confess it now, voluntarily, and feel the chains breaking off you. Or you can say it then, <laughs> with that angel standing next to you, getting ready to escort you into where you're going to burn forever and ever and ever. Uh, the Lord led me to do a sermon some years ago called, You're going to live forever somewhere. Either way, you're going to live forever. But where you live forever is on you. Romans 10, again. Verse 13, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14 says, but how shall they ask him to save them unless they believe in him? Then it says, and how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? Then it says, and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Here's the essentialness of those of us in ministry. Because, listen, the ministers, which means servants, the servant's responsibility is to serve, which means to minister. There's, there's too many ministers now, today. God is so good. God said, go ahead. Wait a minute. How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Verse 15 says, And how will anyone go and tell them unless someone sends him? This is what the scriptures are talking about when they say, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace with God and bring glad tidings of good things. In other words, how welcome are those who come preaching God's good news? Verse 16 says, but not everyone who hears the good news has welcomed it. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed in me when I told them? Yet faith comes from listening to this good news, the good news about Christ. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Joseph Smith, not Ellen G. White, not Mary Baker Eddy, not Azusa. Not Carlton Pearson, sure enough, not Carlton Pearson. Not T.D. Jakes, not Paula White calling on angels from other countries and nations and stuff. That's witchcraft. Not Juanita Bynum, who fell off. Not Jackie McCullough, who need to sit down. Not Brian Karn, who lies. Not Jamal Bryant, who need to get out of that pulpit. None of these people, none of these people, can bring salvation to you apart from this. Wow, apostle, you tough. No. Some of us God have in the midst of the storm to tell the people, thus saith the Lord. I know a pastor told me that we don't serve a triune God. If he don't change that statement, he's going to hell. I know another hireling that has infiltrated the pulpit and stole somebody's ministry and tore it down and set up his own little shack who told me Jesus is not God. If he doesn't change that statement and mean it, he's going straight to hell. I know a couple of sisters who told me that God called them into the office of apostle, yet in here you don't find it. If they don't change that statement, they're not going to make it on that old ship of Zion. I know a lot of sisters who said, I'm an elder, which in this book it means man, and yet they are, are, are they transgender or something? But if they don't change that statement, it's time to get into this. 
I know a lot of people, oh, they probably turn in the channel. Some people, if you're watching by internet, you probably didn't cut the... It doesn't matter because, see, you got to work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. It's time to obey what God is saying. An elder is a man. A prophet is a man. In the Hebrew, the prophet is called Norbi. The, the prophet is, is called Nebiah. If, if there wasn't a distinction, then why did God put those two separate words together? Meaning, form them. Why? It's important to understand the time we're in. The enemy is busy. There's a lot of people that left this world that would not have left if they were standing next to God. Because the spirit of death, can, oh glory! Did, did you hear what God just said? God said when he told Joshua and them, when he told them to put the, the blood on the top of the doorpost and on the sides, he said, I will see that and pass over. And I will not allow the destroyer to come in and kill you. <laughs> Everybody want to say, no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Right. But what about the one that you formed? against yourself rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft lord i just thank you for all that i have in you and all that you are in my life for all that you've done for thy servant lord you're just so wonderful you're just so wonderful i can't think of how was my life you. As long as I have Jesus, I have a satisfied mind. This is my prayer. Sometimes I don't have Yes. Mm -hmm.